five, four, three, two, one. There you are. <laughs> so we're live on Facebook. Uh, welcome to Wednesday night Bible study. And uh, glad you're here if you're in the room and glad you're here if you're online. Uh, so we are in Philippians still. We will be in Philippians forever. So um, uh, it is a good book. It is a good book. Um, I'm going to start in chapter 1, verse 27, although we've already covered that. Uh, kind of, It's kind of an on-ramp to what we're going to talk about. Uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Uh, let me read that, and then uh, uh, we'll begin talking about uh, what we are going to talk about. I, I'm going to go uh, actually 27b, which is the end of 27, if you will. Um, so it says um, that you are standing firm in one spirit. You see where I am? Y'all with me? Say I'm with you if I'm with you. Okay, okay, good. Uh, <clears throat> so that you are, uh, let's see, um, I lost my place. <laughs> that you are standing firm, I'm not with me, that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for what? The faith of the gospel. Um, and uh, so Paul is telling the Philippians that they need to make the main thing the main thing, right? Uh, that's what he's saying here. And... Um, and it goes on, it says, And not frightened in anything by your opponents, this is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that, uh, and that from God. For it is granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in Him, but also suffer for His sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. So, having introduced in these verses uh, what he's about to talk about, uh, he's, he's talking here about the... Um, uh, about the unity of the church and the importance of the unity in the church. And so in the first four verses of chapter 2, we, we have a section on, uh, if you will, a formula for spiritual unity, a formula for spiritual unity. And it, and it flows out of what he just kind of pled for in uh, chapter 1, verse 27. Um, that, uh, and that's why... Uh, verse uh, chapter 2 in many texts begin with the word therefore. Uh, my text, the uh, ESV, um, begins with so, but uh, uh, many texts begin with uh, in chapter 2 the word therefore. And um, anytime you see the word therefore in Scripture, you need to ask what it's therefore. therefore. Uh, so um, uh, in this case, he's saying, since I just said this, then this is, to, is the formula for this. Therefore. And um, um, it is based on that plea in verse 27, that it began in verse 27. And as we look at verses 1 through 4, four we're going to notice three things. I spoke of them last week a little bit. But uh, uh, we're going to talk about these three things over the next few weeks. Uh, three things that we notice in verses 1 through 4, if you're taking notes. And that's this. That there are motives for unity. That there are marks of unity. And there is a means of unity. He talks of those three things in verses 1 through 4. Uh, those are the three points that we're going to focus on. But for tonight, we're going to look at the first one because it's, it's so rich uh, and so important. So we're going to look at the motives for unity. And um, motives answer the question, why? Why? Why have unity? Um, the marks of unity that we'll talk about in coming weeks, and, and, and maybe uh, next week, the marks of unity answer the question, what? And then the means of unity answers the question, how? Uh, and so why, then, what we're going to look at tonight, the motives for unity, why should we seek unity? What is unity, and, and how do we experience unity, are the things that we're going to talk about. And so uh, it's very simple, it's very direct, and it's very practical for us as a, as a church. 
uh, as, we, as we talk about these. It's absolutely vital for any church, these things. So look at the first four verses with me, if you will. Um, I'm going to read um, um, from the ESV, uh, the first four verses of chapter 2. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord with uh, and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also the interest of others. Wow. If there is also a formula for racial re- reconciliation, it's right there. It's right there. Um, and uh, so, I mean, I mean it's, it just flew off of the page at me all of a sudden as I was reading that. Uh, so, um, um, the heart of this passage, the heart of, of this passage that I just read is being of the same mind. And that's the, uh, that's the key for unity. Uh, being of the same mind. That's, that's the emphasis here, and we'll see it in more detail, I think, next time. But that's the, the thrust. I, I want you to be like-minded, he says. It's the, the same thing he said in chapter 1, there that we read. One spirit, one mind, striving together, he says. And, and now he tells them why he wants them to be of one mind. He tells, and then he tells them what he means by one mind, and he tells them how they can be of one mind. But first, let's look at the why. Why is it important for us to be of one mind? Why is it important for us to maintain unity in the church? And why is it important for us to have one spirit, to be striving together to eliminate conflict, discord, and disunity? Um, Here are four motives in verse 1. And then an additional one in verse 2. Four motives in verse 1 to start with. Notice them. If therefore there is any encouragement in Christ, if there, there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if there is any affection and compassion. Now let me give you some insight into the technical aspects of this verse. The, the word if introduces in the Greek what is called a first-class conditional clause. I know you're probably not, import, you're not interested in that. But in the Greek, it's, it's a first-class conditional clause. The, the Greeks have different conditions in their if clauses. And based upon the construction of the Greek, you can tell what the if means. For example, if it's a first-class conditional, which this is, it means if, and it is true. Or if, as the fact is, is what he's saying. Uh, there's a conditional clause that means if, and it might be true. And then there's one that means if, and it is possibly true. But the first class conditional form, which we see here, is it means if, and it's absolutely true. So you could substitute another word altogether for if and make it even clearer, and that would be since. And it would say, since there is encouragement in Christ. Not if. Since there is encouragement in Christ. Since there is consolation of love, and so forth. Or better yet, let's use the word because. And that's exactly what it means there. Because there is encouragement in Christ, because there is consolation of love, because there is fellowship of the Spirit, and because there is affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of one mind. Because of all of these things, these these are the driving motives, these are the truths that should compel you as a follower of Christ to have unity. Now let's take it a step further. 
He's not speaking here of doctrinal abstractions. He's speaking of present spiritual experiences, and I'll explain that. Not doctrinal abstractions, but he's speaking of present spiritual experiences. Because you have received encouragement from Christ, because you have received the consolation of love, because you experience the fellowship of the Spirit, because you receive affection and compassion, it's not an abstract thing. It's an actual thing that you have. Do you understand what I'm saying? It, it, it's present. It's spiritual experience that you experience when you do come to Christ. That becomes the motive for unity. Now let's look at the first one, and you're going to see how this kind of unfolds and how it applies because, there's, because there is encouragement of Christ is the first one. The first one is encouragement of Christ. That, that should be our first motive. The, the word encouragement, paraclesis. What do you know about paraclete? What is, you might know it from previous studies. What's a paraclete in the, from the Greek? Does anybody know? One who comes along beside. One who comes along beside. And now that I've said that, you're like, oh, yeah, that's what, that's what a paraclete is. But um, uh, the Holy Spirit is called a paraclete, the, the paraclete. The one who comes alongside and helps. Okay? And it has the idea of uh, coming along s- someone to encourage them, to counsel them, to help them, to exhort them. And what he's saying is, you who are in Christ have experienced his help. He has come alongside you. You are in Christ having benefited from the same union with Christ through the intended encouragement or exhortation, counsel, and help that you have received. And, and what he's saying here is, because Christ has so consistently and faithfully helped you, this is how you ought to respond. Be of one mind. Uh, it's it's a if if the great blessing and encouragement of Christ, if the if the great blessing of His constant forgiveness and constant strength and constant wisdom and constant blessing and constant benediction in your life means anything, certainly you should respond to all of that by striving to be of one mind. Why? Because. That was Christ's great prayer for the church. That's why. John 17, he said, Father, I pray that they may know... uh, excuse, Excuse me. It says, Father, I pray that they may be one, that the world may know that you and I are one. In John 13, 35, he said, By this, by this, all men will know that you're my disciples. If what? If you have love for one another. Listen, I was listening to a pastor today who said that um, a gospel that is preached that only teaches you how to get to heaven is an incomplete gospel. Because Christ said there are two commandments that are equal. It's not enough just to say this is how you get to heaven. You have to say this is how you love your mankind. I've said it before, there's a, there's a, there's a um, vertical element uh, and the picture of the cross is, is the picture of the, of the great commandment. There's a vertical element, loving the God, Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then what? Loving your neighbor as yourself. And so a gospel that says, okay, this is how you get to heaven is an incomplete gospel because it's, it's, it's more than that. Because if you don't love your neighbor, how in the world can you love God? And so J- Jesus himself said, this is how, how people are going to know you're my disciples. If you love one another. The the great passion of the heart of Christ was that His people would be united. That there would be unity among His people. And so what Paul is saying, 
So what is Paul saying here? He's saying this, because you have received such continual, gentle encouragement, exhortation, counsel, and help from Christ, paraclete, since the moment of your salvation you've received these things, since you have been given so much, does not that spur you on to give back to Christ that which is precious to His heart, which is unity? Does the influence of Christ in your life move you in any way to be obedient to Him? To be obedient to His desire? To be obedient to what He wants? Or are we so ungrateful that we would just take, 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 take and never give back to Christ what His desire is? And that's the issue that Paul is talking about here. By the way, this is a, a very powerful point and, and far-reaching. Uh, it's a far-reaching spiritual principle because it, it focuses on obedience as a very personal response to a very personal relationship. You see, when you sin, it's not so much that you are violating a system of religion. It's not that you are violating a system of theology. It's not that you are violating a creedal structure of some type. It's not that you are going against the organization of the church. When you sin, you are literally violating the intimacy of a relationship between yourself and Christ. You're violating the intimacy of the relationship between yourself and Christ when you sin. If you have received, and you have, by the way, is what Paul is saying, if you have received and you have constant encouragement, counsel, exhortation, wisdom from Christ, is that not enough motive that you should give back to Him that which is precious to His heart? He is constantly, constantly, by grace, by mercy, giving you, giving you everything that's precious to you. Can you not give back to Him what is precious to Him? Write this down. This is good. When you bring discord to His church, you violate not so much the church and not so much the doctrine of unity as you do the relationship with Christ. He's saying, you are not... Uh, are you not stimulated in some way to be obedient to Christ by His influence in your life? Are you not so stimulated by His outpouring of encouragement for you? His gentle, gracious, consistent blessing toward you? Are you not moved by that, uh, by that, that you will not respond by maintaining the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace within the place that you worship. If you won't, then you know where your sin is placed. It's against Christ in your relationship with Him. It's an act of ingratitude that disregards His, his personal desire for His church. So know your sin for what it is. Uh, the gracious blessing, the, the gentle encouragement of Christ has so generously been poured out on us. His exhortations to us so clear and compelling, including His exhortations to unity, that we should respond stimulated to obey Him and pursue the harmony that He desires for His church. And to love one another it's basic, it's so basic. Look at the second principle. He says, if there is any consolation of love, that's the second one, any consolation of love. What does that mean? Well, this is the, the second incentive, the second motive, if you will, that, and, and what he's saying is, since the loving tenderness of God in Christ has been all of our experience as Christians... Since in salvation and sanctif sanctification we have known His love and His comfort of love. We have known that comforting, loving, forgiveness and mercy and grace. 
and it has been so abundant to us, shouldn't we be constrained to seek that which is precious to his heart? Again, going back to the subject of unity. It's the same idea. By the way, I believe the first two relate to Christ. The first two motives uh, uh, um, relate to Christ. The second two relate to the Holy Spirit. The first one mentions Christ. The second one flows out of it. The third one mentions the Holy Spirit. The fourth one flows out of that. The word here for consolation is uh, paramuthion. Paramuthion. Uh, I like one translation of it in lexicon. It, it means gentle cheering. Gentle cheering. Some have translated it to mean comfort. Basically, it has the idea of tenderness and of tender counsel. Literally, the, the word means if you just took the component parts, uh, is to, to speak to someone by coming close to his side. That's what consolation means, to, to speak to someone, giving them encouragement, a personal encouragement. Not necessarily that everybody is hearing, but you're coming alongside of them and you're, 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 you're almost whispering to them the, the encouragement uh, so that it's personal. To come close to someone and, and whisper in their ear is, is the picture that we have here. And by the, word, uh, by the way, the, the word is never ever used in any other place uh, other than a friendly way. Uh, the word, uh, it's a word about friendship. It's a word about intimacy. It's a word about loving someone as a friend and being an encouragement in their ear. When is the last time that you are an encouragement to your friend in their ear? You know, we hear a lot of things these days. Many of them are not encouraging. When is the last time that you were intentional, whispering, encouraging things in a personal way to a friend. That's what Christ does to us. He comes alongside of us and he, He's personal in His consol consolation. Consolation of love is, is, the, is the description here. Uh, the word... Agape has to do with the, the greatest love, the highest love, the supreme love. And so what Paul is saying is, look, because you have been so consistently encouraged in your relationship with, to Christ, because you have so frequently and so often had the gentle cheering of Him coming alongside to speak the words of friendship into your own ear, because of that intimate relationship in which He has poured His love and grace into your life, shouldn't you be compelled to be united with your brother, with your sister? And frankly, uh, I say to you, uh, I say again to you, because I don't want you to forget this, that your sin against the unity of the church is not primarily a sin against an unknown entity it's a sin against Christ Himself and your relationship with Him. It's so, so look at your defiance of that for what it is. It's, it's, it's gross ingratitude of the worst order when you promote disunity. You are in effect saying, Christ, I take everything you give, I want everything that I need, and I will take all that you supply, but don't ask for anything in return. It's a violation of that relationship. How many of y'all have ever had a relationship that was toxic? Anybody? A toxic relationship. In that... You gave everything you had to that relationship. You gave all that you had to that relationship, and the other person stabbed you, 
in the back. And it was just a dagger in your heart. When we sin against the unity and we promote disunity, it's that for Christ. And isn't that sad? That's why David in Psalm 51 about his sin, uh, uh, about his sin when he sinned um, with Bathsheba, he, and he sinned against her, by the way, as well. He sinned against Uriah, her husband. Yes, he did. He sinned against Bathsheba. Yes, he did. He sinned against the nation of Israel because he was the king. Yes, he did. He sinned against God's revealed law, the Mosaic Code, which forbade this kind of thing. Yes. But what he said in Psalm 51 is this, Against thee and thee only have I sinned. He recognized his sin for what it was. And that is the focus that every man or woman must have about sin. It's, it's not that I violated a code nearly so much as I have violated a relationship. And Paul speaks in such tender words here because he feels such tenderness toward these people. Uh, there was no harshness here in his tone. There was no abusiveness of his speech. There was, he was not battering them. He was not hammering them with judgment. There, there's no threats here in this text. He doesn't pound on them with the fear of punishment. He asked them to look at the love of Christ. To look at the constant, gentle, cheering encouragement of Christ in their life. The constant outpouring of grace. And remember that Jesus prayed for unity. And that was, his, that was the plea of His heart. And then He asked the Philippian believers, Can you take all of this from Christ and not at least give back to Him? Because if you can't, then that's the stabbing in the back. That's treachery. Thirdly, he moves on to the Holy Spirit in the third motive. He says, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit. It's a word that you know. Does anybody know what that word is? You, you know it as soon as I say it. Koinonia. Koinonia is the word that he uses there. Uh, a, a partnership, a communion, a sharing. Because to put it in the first class conditional, which it is, um, uses the word because there, because you have experienced the fellowship of the Spirit. Because you have koinonia with the, with the Spirit. Listen, do you think the Holy Spirit wants unity? Yes, why? Because there's a desire of Jesus. And Jesus and the Holy Spirit and God are never in disagreement. Y'all need to write that down. That Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit are never in disagreement. They're always in constant unity. So if Jesus desires unity, the Holy Spirit desires unity unity as well. Um, in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, we have all been baptized by the Spirit into one body and have, made, and, and have been all made to drink of the same Spirit. We've all been made of one Spirit. We are, we are all the temple of the Spirit of God the habitation of the Spirit. We're all one Spirit. The Spirit is actually the source of unity. And Paul is saying, you have fellowship with the Spirit, so guess what? Be of one Spirit. Um, you've received all that, the, that a union with the Holy Spirit could provide. Think about it. 
You have the indwelling of the Spirit. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 1, 6 says, you have received all of His benefits. You've been sealed by the Spirit. He has become the guarantor of your internal inheritance. You're filled with the Spirit. Scripture says, you're empowered and enabled for service by the Spirit. You've been gifted by the Spirit. You're continually cleansed by the Spirit. The Spirit is always praying for you with groanings which cannot be uttered in a language that cannot be understood by man, but is, uh, is the language of the Trinity in which He prays unceasingly for you according to the will of God, which you don't know. And that's why you know not what you pray for as you ought. The, the Spirit, therefore, makes intercession for you, is what Scripture says. The, the Spirit has done everything for you. Think about it. Paul says, because here, he says, because the Holy Spirit has effected your regeneration, because the Holy Spirit is effecting your sanctification, because the Holy Spirit is guaranteeing your eternal glory, because the Holy Spirit is unceasingly praying for you with groanings that can't, uh, that can't find human words, because the Holy Spirit is gifting you filling you, producing fruit in you, because He's teaching you, because He's enabling you to resist temptation, because the Holy Spirit has given you the Word, because He is filling you with holy impulses, because He has given you everything pertaining to life and godliness, will you disrupt that by being disunified? Are you saying, okay, I'll take all of that from the Spirit and I'll give nothing back? It says, I want grace upon grace, mercy upon mercy. I want encouragement. I want consolation. I want all the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But don't ask me to do anything. Then he says, fourthly, the fourth motive. Is, he says, if any affection and compassion. Any affection and compassion. Um, the uh, ESV says affection and sympathy. Um he plunges deeper into the Holy Spirit's ministry here. He mentions the Holy Spirit first, and then he, he, he talks about what flows out of the Holy Spirit. He, he plunges into the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Just as the second one reflected on Christ, this fourth one reflects on the, on the Spirit. He says, The Spirit has given you both affection and compassion. So, what does he mean by affection? Affection. He means just that. The, the, the Greek word here is splankna. Splankna. Anybody know what splankna means? It means your guts. Guts. It, it's, the, it's the bowels. That's what it's translated as, is the bowels. So... But it literally, it, uh, it really has to do metaphorically with affection. You ever think about that? Uh, did you know that the Holy Spirit has affection for you? You say, well, what does that mean? You, you, you ever been in love? Hopefully you have. And you just feel it in your gut. You know, you feel it in your gut. I mean, it's just, it's a gut thing, right? Um, that's what splunk nut is. It's the love from the gut, from the bowels. That's a pretty strong love. It's a longing to be with an individual. 
That's, I mean, you just, I mean, when you're away, I used to travel on business, and when you're away, you have that emptiness in your gut because you're not with the one that you love, right? And so it's that, it's that, it's that longing. It's, it's sort of a, a cognitive thing. It's more, it's more than a cognitive appreciation, though. It's a, it's a, it's a longing. And, and I sense here that what he is saying is that you have, you have received the longings of the Spirit, deeply felt affections. For the Jews, the bowels were seen as the seed of their emotions. Uh, it's where they felt things. And so, as believers, think of it, we have received the longings of the Spirit. What He longs for us, we have received. Uh, that's part of His prayer ministry, Romans eight twenty six and 27. He's making intercession for us constantly according to the will of God. And God is hearing and answering Him because He's always praying according to God's will. Remember I said that the Spirit and uh, the Holy Spirit and the Father are never in disagreement. So the Holy Spirit is always interceding you, for you on your behalf within the will of the Father. He's not asking for things that God doesn't want for you. Um, he's praying within the will of the Father. Uh, and what we're seeing then is, is that what He longs for us, He gives us. You ever have your kid ask for something as a gift for Christmas and you want to give it to them? You just want to give it to them, right? I mean, they're longing for something. They're really wanting. I remember um, one Christmas, uh, we used to have a, a, a department store called Hills Department Store. H-I-L-L-S, Hills. And every time we would go into Hills, no, I'm sorry, it was service merchandise. Y'all remember service merchandise? Oh, yeah. It was service merchandise. Every time we would go into service merchandise, I would go over to the electronics section. And there was this little robot that used to put an 8-track tape in called 2XL. And... It was like a trivia type thing. Does anybody know about 2XL? Anybody? But it was a trivia thing. You know, it had subjects like animals and, and uh, geography and things like that. And, and I used to love 2XL. Every time we went into service merchandise, I would go over there and I would play with it. And, you know, it, it would ask you a question. It would ask you to press A, B, C, or D. And you, you would press it and he would congratulate you if you got the right answer. If you got the wrong answer, he would explain the, the question. And, and so I remember every time I went in there, I, I wanted, uh, I would play with that. And I told my parents I wanted it. They always said no. But guess what I got for Christmas? A 2XL. And I was like, yes! Why did that happen? Because my parents longed to give me that which I desired. And so, what He longs for us, He also gives to us, is what the Holy Spirit does. And so He says, since you have received the affections of the Spirit. I think, uh, really, I don't think we've, fully understand this relational aspect. It's not, just, it's not just God is this cold, hard, indifferent deity who functions like a machine. And if you happen to be a Christian, the machine spits out good things. No, that's not it at all. It's a relationship and Christ is there encouraging and exhorting and ministering and giving grace upon grace and comfort and encouragement and, and cheering us on and giving us blessing. And when you fall, He picks you up. And when you sin, He forgives you. And when you need strength, He infuses strength to you. And when you need wisdom, He grants it to you, according to Scripture. And it's this personal thing that He, he loves you, and so He gives you these things. 
didn't know this was going to rile me up a little bit. But, but when you sin, you violate that relationship. You violate that intimacy. And the same with the Spirit. The Spirit is not some floating fog of some sort of that mystically makes things happen. The Spirit is a person. It's the person of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is a person who lives inside of you and the Spirit longs for your good and for your blessing. Longs for your Spirit, uh, for, uh, uh, for, for your blessing. The, the Spirit longs to pour out benedictions upon you. And it is the longings of the Spirit that you have received through the grace of God. And then he adds the word here, compassion. Um, to, uh, it's, it's translated uh, the mercies of God, tender mercies of God. You've received the longings of the Spirit for you and the tender, compassionate sympathy of God through the Spirit. God has been sympathetic. Sympathetic to you. In today's environment, have you in turn been sympathetic with others? You know, let's face it, God gives us way more than we deserve. Amen. He pours out grace upon us. He pours out mercy. Mercy upon mercy. He has a heart of pity toward us, a heart of tenderness toward us. And so here is the Holy Spirit that we're fellowshipping with. Koinonia. We're fellowshipping with. We, we share the life of the Spirit in us. It's His life in us. He regenerates us. He sanctifies us. He gives us the gifts, the power, the resources, and fruit to do everything that we do. Everything that we do that turns out to be an honor to God, listen to this, everything that we do that turns out to be an honor to God is a product of the Holy Spirit. And then He shows to us compassion and tenderness and mercy and sympathy and pity and care. And so Paul says, because you have received all of this, shouldn't you be of the same mind in unity? If you come into the church and divide the church and you... You've been terribly disloyal to the loving Christ and the loving Spirit who long for the unity of the church. And if you're sitting there and you're in, in a meeting or if you're in some other situation and you're saying, man, I'm going to get my way. Uh, I think this is the way that we need to go and I'm going to stick to this and nobody's going to... Nobody's going to tell me otherwise, and it doesn't matter if anybody else wants to or not. This is the direction that we're going to go. We're going to get blue carpet, not red. And that's, that's what's going to happen. And so, if you're sitting there and you're saying this, just see for it what it is. It's promoting disunity. Disunity. And as Paul said, Paul's approach here isn't threatening. Paul's approach would be like this. Let's say you wanted your son to conduct himself in a certain way. You could call him in and you could say, Alright son, you've got two hours to change your conduct or you're out of this house for good. You're out of here and I'm serious. Or you could say, look, you've been doing the wrong thing and I want you to learn a lesson to do the right thing. So bend over. I'm going to well on you for the next hour. 
Paul's approach isn't like that. Paul's approach is different here. There's, there's no threats. There's no rod like he wants to pull out with the Corinthians. I mean, there's a time for the rod. Don't get me wrong. And Paul wants to pull it out on the Corinthians, if you ever read Corinthians. He's ticked when he talks to the Corinthians. But here, Paul's approach is different. It's a very tender approach. It'd be like this. It'd be like a father sitting down with his son and saying, Son, you've been loved in this family. Have your mother and I loved you faithfully? Have we encouraged you? Haven't we provided for you? When you're down and sad, haven't we come alongside you and offered you compassion and care and sympathy? And when you are hungry, haven't we provided food for you? Haven't we given you clothing? Haven't we nurtured you as you grew from a little child? We've provided you all the medical care that you've ever needed to live a healthy life. We've given you a warm environment to live, a bed to sleep in, a room to live in. Son, we've shown you deep affection. We've been, we've been gracious to you in times when you were disobedient and rebellious and gracious to forgive you and to love you and to restore you. Son, we've shown you sympathy. We've shown you mercy. We've been patient with you while you were learning how to do things right and often did them wrong. You've known us as affectionate and compassion, upon, uh, having compassion upon you. We've been good to you, son, since all of those things are true. Isn't it reasonable that, you, that we ask you to live in such a way that would bring us joy? Seems pretty reasonable, doesn't it? It'd be, I think, pretty hard for a child to deal with that if all of those things were true. And that's the whole point of Paul's plea, you see. It's, it's all based upon the goodness of, of God, the goodness of the Lord. And he can take that approach with the Philippians because they're really a good people. It's a good church. He knows their heart. So he doesn't want to blast them up and down. He doesn't want to take the rod to them. And it's such a, an appropriate one for, for us here because I see so much of a parallel. We're a great church, I think. Pleasant Grove is a, is a great church with great people. I think there's a parallel here. But because we have received such graciousness from God, and not that there's any disunity in our body, I'm not saying that there is, but, but because we have been such, uh, such graciously provided by God, all of these things, doesn't it make sense for us to continue in unity? And so, I see us in the Philippian church. Paul's heart was bonded to them. I too, as your pastor, have become bonded in many ways to this body. And when I call you to unity, it would, it's not as a threat. I'm not threatening you in any way as I say we have to be unified. I don't, I don't want people to see it as a threat. It would be to call you like Paul does from the, from the highest and holiest motive of love, of gratitude, of honor, and loyalty to that relationship that you have with Christ. I'm calling upon your good relationship with Christ to be united with one another. They, and they understood relationships 
in the Philippian church. And so that's the approach he takes. And it's the highest approach as well. You can't always take the highest approach because some people aren't willing to live on the highest plane. But what he says is this. All of our present experiences with Christ and the Holy Spirit should motivate us to have the same mind. Why? Because that's the Spirit's longing and it's Christ's longing. And uh, let's see. So why? I'm going to go a little further. Why? Because it's the Spirit's longing, it's the Christ's longing, and then he adds one more. And this is so good. Verse 2. Make my joy complete by being of the same mind. And you say, well, what's this? Well, what's he saying? He's saying, look, if you can't get in touch with your intimate relationship with Christ, and you can't quite, quite get in touch with this idea of your intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit, if you can't do it for Christ's sake, if you can't do it for the Spirit's sake, because I know you love me, do it for what? Do it for my sake. Because I know you love me. You've already shown that. So if you can't do it for Christ's sake, if you can't do it for the Spirit's sake, do it for my sake. But there's something warm about that, I think. He's talking to them as a pastor would. And he's saying basically what I would say to you. Look, beloved, do it for Christ's sake. Do it for the sake of relationship that He longs to have with you. Don't be unfaithful to that relationship. Do it for the Spirit's sake in which He has been so faithful to you. Don't be unfaithful to Him. And if you can't do it for any other reason, make my joy complete. Because I love you. And I want the best for you as well. As I shared last time, my greatest fear, and I think any pastor's greatest fear in any church, is disunity. Make my joy complete, beloved, Paul says, by being of the same mind. I think Paul had the same concern. As a pastor, as a pastorly model, he had the same concern. Hebrews 13, 17, and I will end right there. Herbert, Hebrews 13, 17, it's a very important verse along the same line. It says this, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief. It's the same thought. If you can't do it for any other reason, do it for those who lead you. Make their joy complete. That's a legitimate plea, and it's a plea that's in Scripture. So I will end there. Do you have any comments?